Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to PPIM 2022. Uh, this is paper number 87. My name is Colin Scott. I'm a senior pipeline integrity engineer working with OneBridge Solutions. Um, OneBridge Solutions is the developer of the Cognitive Integrity Management uh, software platform. One of the things that we spend a lot of time doing at OneBridge is thinking about uh, data compilation, uh, data alignment, data analysis. And one of the key things that comes into play is our data quality. Uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about today is not just data quality, but more uh, what are the quality of the decisions that we're making based on our various data. So what I'll be doing today is I'm going to be talking about the impact of failure pressure accuracy and precision on integrity management and decision making. So as I'm hoping all of you will know, there are various failure pressure models available to industry. Uh, we can think about ASME B31G and its various subsidiaries like the R-String and P-squared models. Some of you might be familiar with uh, API 579, British Standard 7910, the CoreLAS model, uh, DNB's recommended practice F101, or the, the recently developed MAT8 model from PRCI. Each one of these different models can be used for either crack assessment or corrosion assessment, depending on, on which model that we're dealing with. But one of the things that we sometimes forget is that the models that we're working with are not perfect. We usually do an assessment calculation. We get a number, we assume it's fixed in stone, and we move forward with it. But in this presentation, we're going to be thinking about how does the accuracy and precision of each one of these models affect some of our decisions. Now, with no failure model being perfect, what we can do is various validation studies to see how accurate, how precise these models are. Now, what I've done as part of this work is to work my th way through the various industry literature where people have done uh, different validation studies. And what I've done is I've, I've found the accuracy and precisions of the various models as they've been reported by the industry literature. Um, and as I demonstrate statistically as we go forward, um, the accuracy and precision really will affect, uh, will influence the effectiveness and the efficiency of our, our various integrity programs. So in order to demonstrate my, my statistical methodology in, in demonstrating the efficiency or the effectiveness of the various models, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work uh, my way through a, a hypothetical assessment. So Let's consider a situation where you have a hypothetical flaw and you've assessed it with a safety factor of 1.10. And in this case, I'm defining the safety factor as being the predicted failure strength divided by the operating pressure. So hypothetically, if you calculate a safety factor of 1.10, you would very likely put that on your dig list or your, your mitigation list. Um, it's not something that would necessarily require an immediate response, but it's something you wanna to get to sooner rather than later. But let's say hypothetically that the assessment were performed using a model in which there was a known or, or quantifiable uncertainty. So let's consider the scenario where we had a model which had an accuracy reported as uh, 1.20. And in this case, I'm saying uh, consider that the true failure pressure divided by predicted model failure pressure is 1.2, meaning that we've got some conservatism within this model. And then also consider that this particular model has a reported standard deviation of 15%. Now we've got a little bit more to work with. And we have to ask ourselves, is mitigation the right decision in this case? Well, let's take a look at how the statistics work out. So here I have a plot of, um, of safety factor on the x-axis and the probability uh, density function on the y-axis. So let's see if I can find a laser pointer here. So here consider the safety factor that we just calculated of 1.10. That's shown by the red X here. Now, we know from our model statistics that I found in the literature that we have a bias of about 20%, which means that the normal curve that's describing the true safety factor distribution is shifted over to the right by about 20 percent 
And here the normal curve that's defining the true safety factor distribution has a precision of 15%. So what we can do here is we can have a good look at this and say to ourselves, is it reasonable that the safety factor of 1.10 flaw really does need to be repaired or mitigated? Well, let's take a look at the various uh, ways that we can um, consider decision points. If we take a decision point at safety factor of 1.0, this represents a scenario in which you have a flaw in which the predicted failure pressure is equal to the operating pressure. And that's going to be a scenario in which you're probably going to run out and, and do a repair very, very soon because you're risking imminent failure. Now, when we look at this normal curve distribution that represents the true failure pressure or the, the true safety factor, we realize that there's actually a very, very small chance here that we're actually dealing with a true defect. So there's a, a very small chance that we really do need to run out and, and deal with this um, much more quickly. On the flip side, if we look at a decision point at 1.39, the typical safety factor on, a, on an oil and gas pipeline in the United States at least, we see that there's actually quite a substantial um, area of our normal curve that's over 1.39. And this represents a scenario where our assessed flaw is actually benign and we don't need to worry about it. Now, there's a large area here on our normal curve that, that represents uh, a responsible decision. If we take a look at uh, the integral of the area under this normal curve, we'll find out that we have about a 2% chance that we're dealing with a true defect. We've got about a 27% chance that we're dealing with uh, a benign flaw, and we've got about a 71% chance that we're making a responsible decision. So that really puts that really puts the assessment in context. Now I'm hoping that that kind of sort of makes sense. Um, it's a fairly simplistic thing to think about, and I hope that when I demonstrate it graphically like this, that you can you can recognize that there really is um, a relatively simple way that we can think about the efficiency of of this model and this calculation. What I've done for the purposes of this paper is to define the, uh, the efficiency as being what percentage of that normal curves area is actually below a safety factor of 1.39. What is the probability that you're actually making a good and responsible decision as opposed to accidentally, inadvertently responding to a benign defect that really doesn't need any repairs? So in this particular case, I would say, the probability that I'm dealing with a defect is 2%, the probability that I'm making a responsible decision is 71%, and that would translate to, in, in my world, uh, an efficiency of about 73% for this model on this assessment point. Hopefully that makes sense. So I'm going to ask you all to do a, a thought experiment, and I want you to think about that bell curve that, that represents the true uh, safety factor on a given flaw. Now, if I had done an assessment and found out that the flaw was more serious than a 1.1, um, that would, uh, that would in, in fact shift the whole bell curve to the left. If I had done an assessment and found out that the safety factor was higher than 1.1, that's going to shift that whole curve off to the right. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, let's say that I was looking at a different model with a different accuracy and a different bias. If I had a less conservative model, that would move my bell curve to the left. If I had a more conservative model, that would move my bell curve to the right. If I have a different model precision, that's going to either give me uh, a taller or narrower bell curve, or it's going to give me a shorter, fatter bell curve. So if you think about it, for any particular combination of assessed safety factor, um, and model accuracy and model precision, I'm going to get a different bell curve, and I'm going to get a different area under the curve that's less than 1.39, meaning that I'm going to be able to estimate what's the efficiency of a, of a given assessment for a given model. So as I mentioned earlier, I scoured through the literature to find um, to find out some accuracy and precision as reported by various researchers. So here, what I've done is I've looked at several models. 
I've separated out the data by corrosion models, um, by cracking models, or uh, specifically stress corrosion cracking models. Now, as most of you know, uh, the same models are typically used uh, for both cracking and stress corrosion cracking, but they don't necessarily have the same accuracy and precision for those given data sets. So I've decided to separate them out. You'll see most of the models here, most of you will be quite familiar with, as me modified um, B31G for corrosion, r string, the more recent P squared model. Most of you will be familiar with original log secant, API 579, British Standard 7910, uh, and Coralas for the various cracking. Um, some of you might not be familiar with the GEM model. Uh, this is a model that I've been developing for the last two or three years. Um, it's it's uh, it's similar to the um, the log secant model. However, it's been derived primarily based on depth, whereas the original log secant model was derived primarily based on length. That actually makes quite a big difference. So I've included my gem model in the various statistics here. You'll see in these columns that I have an accuracy, and this is basically a mean failure ratio that's been reported in the industry data. Uh, numbers that are well above one are very conservative models. Uh, any model which has an accuracy below one so for example, uh, Corlass semi-ellipse model shows a 0.96. That represents a slightly non-conservative model. And then we can see the precision is uh, standard deviations based on the, the failure ratios of the various data sets. So all of these are numbers that I've pulled out of the literature. Um, you can go and find them online. You may well have the paper sitting on your desk and you can confirm these numbers. So these accuracies and precisions um, I basically use to calculate the various biases and, and, and standard deviations, and all these can be used to, to do the uh, integral, the area under the curve integral, to determine what the estimated efficiency of these models is. So let's take a look first at corrosion. So when it comes to the corrosion models, I'm looking at the modified B31G equation that most of you are familiar with. Um, I'm looking at r string, which is the, the level two type assessment, effective area method. And I'm looking at the P-squared model, which was recently developed by PRCI. And that P-squared model is a refinement of the r string model. Um, I've also included um, my gem model. Uh, I've considered both semi-ellipse and uh, I have a special algorithm that I, uh, I use to look at profiles. So I've, I've looked at these five different combinations. Now, let's hypothetically say that we were doing an assessment and we found that we had a safety factor for a given flaw of one. That would typically get us worried because that means that our predictive failure pressure is um, equal to the operating pressure and we're, we're risking an imminent failure. But when you look at this plot, you'll see that the efficiency of this particular model is about 33%. Meaning that if we're doing an, our, our assessment with the modified B31G model, there's only about a 33% chance that our true safety factor is below 1.39, which means that we're probably spending a lot of time and effort and money on doing repairs that we don't necessarily need to do. If we were to do the same assessment uh, with an r string model, and we had a safety factor of one, based on this data, that would demonstrate that we had about an 80% efficiency, meaning that there's about an 80% chance that the, the true safety factor on the flaw is uh, below 1.39, and we're, we're being very smart in, in dealing with it straight away. So in general, what you can do is you can look at the curves that I've developed here, and you can say that anything is that is falling to the lower uh, left of the plot is a very inefficient model. Anything that's, that's standing more upright on the upper right side of the plot tends to be a more, um, more efficient model. And here we can see as we move from the B31G to the r string and, and more refined models, we're getting a big, big improvement um, in our efficiency for a given assessed safety factor. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, it takes a little bit of time to kind of wrap your head around what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm hoping that graphically um, you can figure out where I'm going with this and, and see that there it really is a very, very big difference in efficiencies between the various models. Another thing that I'm interested in looking at is not just the efficiency, but what is the possibility that you're going to make some really bad decisions based on your model choice. And so the first thing to think about is 
what is the possibility, what is the probability of having a false negative? And by that, I mean, what is the probability of having a true defect with a safety factor of below 1.0 uh, being accidentally assessed as safe with a safety factor of 1.39? If you were to assess a, a flaw at safety factor of 1.39, you're sitting right on the you're sitting right on the hairy edge of, of to dig or not to dig. What's the possibility that that actually has a true defect? So that's a false negative that essentially represents a safety issue with your analysis technique. The other thing I want to look at is false positives, and that I define as the probability of having a true benign flaw with a safety factor of uh, 1.39 or, or perhaps 1.25 if you're working in Canada. What is the probability of a true benign flaw being assessed as an immediate um, with safety factor of 1.0? So that would represent a situation where you did an assessment on a flaw, you found a very worrying safety factor, you uh, you know you called in the cavalry, you ran out there, and, and you did a an uh, you did a dig or repair or, or mitigated somehow, um, and in fact that flaw really didn't need to have any mitigation. So that would be a false positive representing. Um, a poor use of resources and, and time and money. So if I work through that same sort of exercise with my various normal curves, looking at the um, effectiveness, I can come up with some statistics that, that are pretty eye-opening. When you work with something like modified ASME B31G, as we saw before, um, it appears to be a fairly low efficiency model. But because of the large, um, the large spread in data points because of the poor standard deviation of this model, there is an actual finite chance that you're going to accidentally miss some serious features. So in the case of the false negatives, if you're looking at a safety factor of 1.39, uh, my mathematics shows that there's about a 3% chance that you could miss a feature. If you're working in Canada with a 1.25 safety factor, that number actually goes up to about 5%. So that's something that we really need to be aware of. Although something like a modified B31G sort of is generally considered in industry to be fairly conservative, uh, because of the poor precision of this model, we do actually have a, a you know, pretty reasonable um, risk of, of missing a defect. So we should think about that. The flip side is as we go and look at the false positives, we see that the probability of having a false positive with the ASME B31G is very, very high. 67% in the U.S. and 76% in, in Canada represents there's a very, very um, high probability that we're spending an awful lot of money unnecessarily. Now, as with uh, the efficiencies that we saw before, as we move from B31G to the more refined models like the R-Strang and P-squared, where you move towards my GEM model, you're actually improving things quite a bit. There's still a possibility of having some um, false negatives, but they're substantially less than they would be for ASME B31G. Um, when you look at the false positives, you've got a substantially less chance of, of um, spending your money poorly. So that's, uh, that really is an eye-opener for me in terms of understanding uh, how, how these models are going to affect people's integrity programs. Let's take a look at some of the other flaw types. Let's take a look at cracks next. So here, just like I did before with the crack models, I've got five different crack models, um, most of which will be familiar with you, to you. Uh, British Standard 7910, API 579, the original log secant model, CoreLAS, and, uh, and my GEM model. And similar to what I showed you before, any one of the curves that falls to the lower left, say for example, British Standard 7910, this represents uh, a fairly poor efficiency in a model, meaning that you're you've got a much higher likelihood of doing a repair that's not entirely necessary. As you move towards the original log secant models in API 579, you do get an improvement. And when you go to the CoreLAS and GEM models, you find that there's a, a, a much higher efficiency. So that really represents you're spending your money a lot wiser in terms of your integrity program. I mentioned before that I've separated out the crack, the basic cracks and the stress corrosion cracks because these uh, these particular features tend to behave a little bit differently. When we look at the SCC models, we find that uh, the modified log secant model and the MAT8 model um, show a, a comparable efficiency, which is 
perhaps not quite as good as we would like to see it. Um, but if we move to CoreLAS or the, the GEM model, we get a much bigger improvement in, in efficiency. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is that the models that I've seen in industry, and some of you might know, you know more about this than I do, um, I have not seen any industry models that take into account crack shielding. Um, when you read the literature of stress corrosion cracking, you often see pictures of stress corrosion cracking colonies where there are multiple parallel cracks. Those parallel cracks actually shield one another and decrease the overall stress intensity felt by each one of the cracks. Now, if you look into the math and you look into the literature, you'll find that the change in stress intensity factor for um, a crack colony is between about 10% and 30%. And that translates to a difference in J integral of about 20% to 50%, depending on the conditions. So that really, really does have um, quite a substantial effect on, on how our burst pressure calculations um, turn out. Um, my, my GEM model does does have a correction factor that takes into account that stress intensity. And uh, based on this data, it seems to be working uh, quite successfully. As with the corrosion models, we can also take the, the cracking SCC models and come up with um, the false positive and, and false negative statistics. I don't really have time to show them to you here, but they're certainly, they're all in the paper if you want to take a look. So my conclusions are really just a couple of discussion points that um, that I, I hope I've given you something to think about. Each one of the failure pressure models that we're using in industry has an estimated accuracy and precision. And in my case, I've, I've taken all those accuracy and precision data straight out of the literature. So if anybody wants to cross check or if anybody has any other validation studies that might be of interest, um, that might shift some numbers a little bit. And that accuracy and precision translates to um, a, a different efficacy and efficiency for each one of the models for a given assessed safety factor. Um, the technique that I've come up with is, is somewhat graphical. Um, it seems to work for me. I'm, I'm hoping that as you saw the different plots, you get a sense of what I'm doing in terms of aligning the, the normal curves with the assessment points and looking at the areas under the curve. Uh, to me, it makes sense. I'm, I'm hoping that you followed that. Uh, now, any operators out there will be choosing different failure pressure models for their assessments, whether they be cracking or corrosion or stress corrosion cracking. Um, and everyone's gonna have a different risk tolerance. So everyone's gonna be looking for a Goldilocks solution of how do you balance out your safety considerations versus your cost and resource considerations. And that's up to all of you to uh, sort of figure out for yourselves. I'll say that the industry models tend to be conservative on average, which is a good thing. It implies that we've got a safe industry, and I think we do. Uh, but there are gonna be some scenarios where you've got a model that's got very poor precision, and that can lead to some, some bad decisions. So um, I, I, think, I think that's worth keeping in mind that uh, there's no perfect solution here, there are no perfect models, and we have to be cognizant that um, that, that Goldilocks balance is perhaps more challenging than we think it is. Now, before letting you go, I'm just going to give you one, one last thing to chew on. And that is, let's take a good look at the R-String model. Um, if you read a recent PRCI report, there was a study of R-String that demonstrated a bias of about 31% uh, for that data set and a standard deviation of 10% for that data set. So when you stop and think about this statistically, the bias in the model is three times the standard deviation meaning that there's a difference between the model prediction and reality that is three times the standard deviation. And when you look at this particular plot, that basically demonstrates that there's a slim to nothing chance that you have a problem if you're actually assessing a flaw using R-string with a safety factor of 1.39. Um, if you think about it, our string is based on the B31G equation, which is used for a lot of corrosion assessments. And it's also used as part of the basis of CoreLAS, part of the basis of API 579 or MAT8 for cracking, and part of the assessment of British Standard 7910. When you look at this plot, that really does give you a good sense of why all of these models are conservative, um, because the underlying mathematics of B31G lead to conservative solutions. My philosophy on that is because B31G is based largely on length considerations, 
um, which I don't believe is appropriate for uh, the flaw assessments we're doing. I feel that the flaw assessments we're doing should be based primarily on depth, and that's the uh, that's the basis of my gem for you, formulation. So I hope you'll give that a chance. You'll have a chance to think about that, and uh, maybe we can work together going forward to uh, uh, try and improve both accuracy and precision of the models available, and in doing so, improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our various integrity uh, programs. Hopefully that made sense to you and, and I've given you something to think about. Um, thank you very much for your time and uh, I, I hope you're enjoying the conference. Thank you.